Hi, I'm Alan Smith, and I'm a local VOR. You know, it's one thing to talk about being local. But it's another thing to live and support it. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. Today, we're focused on the power of local. As you know, local is that term typically associated with phrases like locally grown or locally sourced. If you've ever purchased produce from your local farmer's market, odds are that they were grown by small farmers and growers within your region of the state, often within a 50 mile radius. After all, road trips were meant for people, not food. So what's all this interest in local? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense, personally. It's better on the environment because you're not transporting food long distances. Secondly, you keep the money in your local community, which is very important. And third, you can create some, well, meaningful relationships with some of the producers of food. And fourth, and lastly, I think the food often tastes better. So in the spirit of the pursuit of local, we travel to the city of Conway, Arkansas, where this community is being impacted by a group calling themselves the locals. How clever. From the beginning, uh, The Locust has been an organization that's about community and about uh, caring for the place we live in, caring for each other. And so food is something that unites us all, no matter what part of the spectrum you're in, we're all, we all eat food. So it was for us a very natural step to start having uh, relationships with farmers and cooking with local food. The Faulkner County Urban Farm Project began as actually a competition between the three colleges here in Conway. And once the competition was over, they actually decided to break down the walls of the competition and make one big community garden to kind of bring up not only college students into the project, but also kids and community members as well. We have a children's garden club that meets every week. So we just try to get the kids out into the garden and teach them about gardening and um, certain like nature things and how to grow fruits and vegetables and like life cycles of bugs and plants and they really have a lot of fun playing out there. We felt like it was a good vehicle to try to slowly uh, transform the culture that we live in because at the end of the day it's the habits and the everyday lifestyle of people that make an impact. I think shopping local is important because you support the local farmers, the local economy, and the food tastes great too because it's fresh. Sitting along the banks of the Arkansas River, today Little Rock is a city where old mixes with the new in surprising ways. Here in the historic Quapaw Quarter area, I restored this house and created the first garden home. This is where I launched my television series. I have to say, I really enjoy being a part of the fabric of a historic neighborhood. And it's exciting what's going on just a few blocks over on Main Street. Soma, a name referring to the downtown district of South Main, is experiencing a revival in interest and population. Embracing its southern heritage, the district is focused on local. It also acts as a center for arts in the city with murals, public sculptures, and houses the Oxford American, a magazine dedicated to featuring the best of Southern writing. Without question, my favorite aspect of this entire revitalization is the food scene. Whether it's a fresh brew with homemade breads for breakfast or refined Southern cuisine experienced at night, the ingredients for many of the dishes you'll find in Soma's restaurants are sourced from local farmers. 
lot of people uh, in the food industry really want to, they want to showcase good food and we want to showcase good food and we want to showcase local foods and local sourcing is really important to us. Most of the time a restaurant when it's opening will plan a menu and then try and find sources for the things that they want to have on the menu. For us, we looked first at what was available in, in central Arkansas from local farms and we built a menu based on that. And that way we can maximize the amount of local food that we use on our permanent menu. If you look at the variety of uh, vegetables that you can get at a farmer's market when things are in season, it's so much greater, so much fresher than what you'll find at the grocery store. So, I mean, tomatoes are just a great example. If you go to the grocery store, you're gonna find, you know, two or three very standard varieties. But if you go to the farmer's market in the summer, you'll see literally dozens of varieties of tomatoes, of, you know, all different colors and shapes and sizes. They all have different flavors too, and they're just, uh, it, they're so much more delicious than what you can get at the grocery store. Local food is better for the environment, and this is a, a general statement, it's not true in every case, but for the most part, small farmers tend to be better stewards of the environment because they're using diversification and crop rotation and methods like that, where larger farms might use uh, chemical inputs, and fertilizers and uh, pesticides and things. Um, it's better for the local economy, and you know this makes a lot of th sense when you think about it. But if you spend your dollars locally, then they stay here in this in this local economic system, and they can be recycled again and again, so that it, the the revenue benefits people who live here and also the the tax base of the local economy. And then the last is that it's more transparent. So if you want to know something about your food and you're buying it at a farmer's market, you can ask the farmer directly how it was raised, what did they feed their chickens, what did they use on their broccoli, and, and you can get any of the answers that you want to know. If you really want a behind the scenes look, or should I say taste of Soma, swing by the Bernice Garden Farmer's Market on Sundays, May through November. Tasting is believing, and be sure to meet and say hi to the local farmers for me while you're there. While Soma continues to grow by leaps and bounds, just up the street here, another part of Little Rock is undergoing an evolution of its own. In the Creative Corridor, located between 3rd and 7th Streets, economic and community growth is being stimulated by the arts rather than what was once a traditional retail base. Here, the city is developing unique relationships with developers and nonprofits to subsidize the consolidation of scattered art groups. One of the more interesting and ecologically friendly aspects of this project is the way in which they've transformed the streetscape. During the construction phase, you could walk by here, and this is you know, eight, 10 feet deep, so they added different layers and really created a filtration, mm -hmm. natural filtration mm -hmm. system to clean that water before it all winds up back in the Arkansas yeah. River. One of the first places I put down roots was right here in Little Rock, and it's been fun to watch this place evolve over the years, especially in the arts and culinary areas. I opened the Green Corner store because I wanted a place where we could have an independent local retailer that was um, really showcasing the local entrepreneurs and their creativity. We have a lot of Arkansas made products and food products and crafts and clothing and other things. We've really um, accumulated many, many different artisans and we've helped to mentor Arkansas made products so they can, are ready for the marketplace. The store really is, stands for a platform to advocate for green living, to have healthier lifestyles. Everything that's brought into the store is about that. So the green, sustainable, organic part of it, it also happens to be my last name. So the building we're in has been here for 110 years. We're sort of taking it back to its roots because it originally, for the first 70 years of its life, it was a drugstore, pharmacy, and soda fountain. And um, now we have a wellness department and trying to encourage people to eat healthy foods, not have a lot of additives in their food, and we have an operating soda fountain. The great thing about that is, is the ice cream itself is made locally and it uses locally made products that are sourced whenever possible from farmers in Arkansas.
we wanted to prove that you can support your local neighborhood and we're located in an area that's walkable, that has public transportation. Um, we have workshops and we help to educate the customer on living a greener lifestyle, on the importance of shopping locally. Um, we do host a lot of times our local farmers that are making other products or sampling. We uh, educate people on all phases of the food chain. I support buying local because it creates stronger local communities, stronger local economies. It's better for the environment and it tastes better. Anything closer to home is always better. Just can't believe all of these choices. There's so many beautiful plants here. You know, I love going to a local independent garden center because there's so many fabulous choices. Take for instance this array of hookahs or coral bells as they're commonly known. This plant has gone an amazing transformation over the past 10 years or so. The hybridizers have come up with a whole myriad of foliage colors. With color like this in foliage, who needs blooms, right? Now, the beauty of this plant well, certainly comes through, obviously, in the leaves, but it's also beautiful in that it will take the shade. If you have issues with shade and have trouble finding things that will grow, this is a plant to think about. It's also a perennial, meaning it's going to come back. The other thing is that hookahs are native to North America, so they are an indigenous plant. So if you want to take that whole local idea a little further, native plants fit into this whole local movement. But let's get back to the color because that's the exciting thing about this family of plants. The range of color is really quite kaleidoscopic. I mean, you look at some of these leaves that are, that are blotched and veined and marbleized. They come in ranges of reds and pinks and burgundy. And then you look at whole categories that are often autumnal in color, like this apricot colored one with darker veining. Some of them are even orange colored. And then there are the ones that are chartreuse, that really sort of screaming electric yellow that really makes any garden pop. If you're looking for some visual interest in a shady dark area, try one of these chartreuse hookahs. But for me, for this container I'm creating, I'm just gonna do a mixture of kind of the same color family with just a little splash of this coming through. I think it'll make an interesting container to go in a shady spot on the porch. Give hookahs a try, you'll be glad you did. They say art imitates life, so it's no surprise that natural state glass artisan, James Hayes, takes much of his inspiration from his South Arkansas surroundings. I came from a family, we had a dental laboratory, I always grew up working with my hands and building tree houses, things like that. But I've been blowing glass for 27 years now, and it's uh, my main occupation. And I continue my education. I learn more new techniques and about business and uh, about teamwork, too. Glass is dangerous, and you get a certain adrenaline rush playing with hot molten glass that's 2,000 degrees. And you also, it's very hypnotizing because you have to keep the glass centered and it's constantly you know, going in a spiral motion and you just kind of get into a trance. And it's also a lot of fun because you uh, get to listen to music while you work. We have an uh, electric furnace. It holds uh, 300 pounds of glass. It's on 24 hours a day. It holds clear glass, and we use, uh, for example, use a blowpipe, take a gather of glass, let it cool, take another gather of glass, and then we'll roll it in frit, which is colored glass. We'll heat that up, make a design, a spiral design, or spotted, or pulled, or, and then we'll, uh, 
make a starter bubble, and then we'll gather another gather of glass, and we use uh, cherry wood blocks to shape the glass into a round ball and inflate it more, inflate it to the size we want. We'll transfer the glass, we'll get a, a punny rod with a piece of glass on the end, we'll flatten the bottom, stick it to the bottom of the bubble, and transfer the bubble onto the punny rod, and then we can open up this, heat it up, we can put a you know, decorative trailing thread of glass on it. And when the piece is finished, We'll knock it off and get Kevlar gloves, pick it up, and put it into uh, an annealing oven, which uh, cures the glass. It, the temperature goes down really slow, takes all the stress out of the glass, so it won't crack. We do uh, stemware, we do chandeliers. We have some of those in public places and private homes. And we love making uh, Christmas ornaments. And I just do it because it's what I love. And my father says, you need to pick something that you love to do and, and stick with it. I'm just an artist and I always think like that. You know, so often in our kitchens, we throw things out that could have some long lasting benefits. You know, sometimes in even my kitchen, banana peels and eggshells and coffee grounds and things like that end up in the trash can when they really could be composted and make some lovely soil for your garden plants. Reed Admire of the Urban Food Loop shows us how to rethink those particular food items that tend to go to waste by helping communities with composting and creating marvelous soil. So composting is really important because um, almost 40% of our nation's landfills are filled with food waste. Um, and that creates carbon gas and carbon emissions. And we're all familiar at this point with the greenhouse gas effect and how big of an impact carbon emissions are having. If we started, if everyone was composting, that would be cut by 40%. And compost is also a natural resource that's valuable. It can be worth up to $300 a ton, which is about a truckload. Um, but instead, we're just throwing that into the landfill. Annually, according to um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, we're wasting $168 billion in natural resources because we're throwing food away. So the process of the Urban Food Loop, a customer can sign up, they get a bucket delivered to their house, they scrape all of their food waste in weekly. At the end of the week, we come by and we pick it up and switch it out with a clean bucket. We take the food waste, we compost it on our site or at one of our community partner sites, Dunbar Community Gardens, Western Hills Park. I turn the compost every day, all week, until it's that fine black material. Customers can opt to have the compost returned to them in bulk for fall planting and for spring planting. They can also elect to have seeds started. So this season we're starting kale, beets, carrots, and some flowers. And we will return those to people's home gardens started in the compost that was created from their food waste. In the next 10 years, long term, we'd love to see trash, recycling, compostables on the street. That's long term. Short term, um, we'd love to have 100 customers signed up and participating by this time next year and really connecting more and more people um, to Dunbar, to Little Rock Urban Farms, to South on Main, to, to really see the local food movement not only grow, but to have people participate and become involved into the local food movement. Really it's about sustainability um, and it starts as far as our children um, and to um, our restaurants, schools. Um, it's really about sustainability and um, really educating yourself about what you're not only putting in your mouth but how you are affecting the economy as well.
I don't know about you, but I love flavor pairings. And one of my favorites is really good chocolate with a really nice red wine. What a combination. Now we've all heard this notion of farm to table, right? But what about bean, as in chocolate bean, to bar, as in chocolate bar? Pretty yummy concept, huh? Local chocolate maker Nathaniel Izzard shows us the sweetest part of his job is his relationship with the farmers. It's a very uh, intensive process to go from from raw materials to end product chocolate that we all know. It's a very different uh, product than what I originally thought it was. It's not, it's not as much a candy as I, as I had thought. So there's kind of two, uh, two main uh, markets uh, in the cacao world. There's uh, commodity cacao and then there's fine, fine flavor quality cacao. Uh, commodities traded up and down uh, by, by traders in, in offices and uh, along with coffee and sugar and other commodity products. Um, fine quality cacao is a completely different story. Looking for those farms is very important in the chocolate making process. Looking for farms, for farmers who, who care about their products and, and looking for people who are, who are interested in growing high quality cacao because you can't make good chocolate from bad cacao. The cacao tree uh, originated in South America. It can grow anywhere 20 degrees north or south of the equator. Right now I buy cacao from uh, four different countries. Each region produces different flavors, so there's just gonna be different flavors that, that pop up in uh, depending on the way it's harvested and the way it's fermented and then the environment that the cacao grows in. So uh, like my chocolate from Belize, um, then there are just some really natural uh, dried tart cherry notes in the chocolate itself. Uh, the Dominican Republic is a much bolder chocolatey flavor. It, it has more of that what we usually think of as a traditional chocolatey flavor with some kind of nutty undertones. Um, and then the Tanzania has some really interesting kind of wine, wine flavor notes, uh, some, some raisin backgrounds and some other mango and different fruity notes. And then uh, the Madagascar has a very uh, red fruit uh, flavor. But they're all very different and all of that's um, based on the fact that they're from different regions. And it's like, it's like wine and coffee and other, other products, um, different regions produce different flavors of, of products. And there are a lot of steps that I, I do to help make sure that the flavor that's already there shows up in the end product, but the flavor starts at the farm. Hey, I don't know about you, but buying locally produced and grown products just makes a lot of sense. It's good for the local economy, and plus you're making great relationships, friends with people who are producers. And on top of that, you can ensure that they're gonna be as fresh as possible. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. Mmm, -mm, these berries are so good. Hi, I'm Alan Smith, and I'm a local boy. Book of Ore. Hey, I know y'all like it. Though. Okay. <clears throat> I don't like it. Okay. It's batch number 54. Ask for it by name. <laughs> <laughs>